Jane from SUNY Oneonta with a fashion industry degree. Uh, she also still serves on the fashion advisory board for SUNY Oneonta and she regularly takes on interns from us. So we are very thankful to have her as an alumni. Um, and also she's a 30 under 30 honoree. So that's super cool. Um, and she has owned the underground attic for several years and she actually started it while a student. So Elizabeth, take it away. Awesome. Um, so yeah, my name is Elizabeth Rapelson. Um, I own the Underground Attic Vintage Boutique. So I am both a in-person brick and mortar store and also an online store. Um, but the whole reason I started the Underground Attic was that I, I've always been very interested in vintage clothing. Um, and I started collecting many, many, many years ago. Um, and it was just started out as a personal collection. Um, but then throughout college, um, I decided that that was something I wanted to turn into a career. So I ended up um, starting an online store when I was in college. And then when I graduated, ended up opening my first brick and mortar, which is actually different than the one I'm in now. Um, but they're all authentic vintage clothing and accessories that I clean, mend, do the whole restoration on, um, which is really, really fun. Um, it's cool to see the pieces come back to life. Um, but then I also offer like vintage inspired products too. Um, and everything I do is uh, the modern pieces are all sustainable. Clearly the, clearly the vintage ones are too. So um, yeah, I think that's a good little synopsis. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if anybody has questions for Elizabeth, by all means, pop them in the chat, interrupt whenever. Um, and Elizabeth at some point will also take us through a little walkthrough of her store for anybody who has not had the pleasure of popping in there. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to do that now, we could start with that. That might be Oh, easy. sure. Yeah. That sounds great. Give me one second because I got to unclip you guys. Yeah, we're on yeah. a tripod, so. <laughs> okay. I'm going to start you guys at the beginning and then we are going to walk to the back of the store. So bear with me. Can I turn this around? Yes, I can. Okay. So I'm going to start you from the very beginning in my windows. Um, so I love doing window displays. Um, I oftentimes pick a theme um, and then we'll kind of switch out the stuff that's in it about once a week. It's a little hard to tell what it looks like in the windows, but I have these really nice old school box windows. Um, so I kind of did like a camping theme for these ones. I don't know if you can see, but there's AstroTurf on the floor and the sky background with a bike. And then on this side, it's not lit up right now, but at night this lights up uh, like twinkle lights. So it looks like stars. Um, and there's a little tent back there and a lady with a bunch of moons. So I try to switch those out pretty often. This is my little apothecary section. Tell me if I'm going too fast. Um, but these I have, these are like tarot candles, some nice bath bombs, um, lotions. I love lavender. So there's a lot of like lavender and hand creams and stuff. Um, like there's that. Elizabeth. Sorry, say that again? How do you select your products? That is a great question. Um, by being a shopping addict. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, I actually I use a company called Fair to buy a lot of my wholesale inventory. Um, and the reason I use them is they have a filter. Let me see if I can turn this around while I'm talking to you. Um, there we go. Um, so they have a filter where you can say that you want things that are only made sustainably, only uh, not sold on Amazon, made by a small business, um, different things like that. So I really like that there's that feature. So when I go through there, I'll kind of get an idea like, oh, I want something that's moon inspired because I have this theme that I'm going to do in the store. So then I'll put on all those filters and then start narrowing down which items I think fit the vibe of the store well. Um, so that's for all the modern items. And then for all the vintage items, I do a ton of private appointments with people. Um, and that's really, really fun because uh, you get to hear a lot of the history and um, I'll see like photos and hear how many generations that went down. Um, so I do that and then estate sales and auctions too. Um, but private appointments are my favorite. <laughs> Fantastic. So, 
yeah, so that's the, um, where a lot of this like wholesale stuff comes from. Um, <laughs> this is my new COVID station, <laughs> nice little vintage bar cart. Um, but there were definitely some adjustments we had to make, you know, reopening. So I've got hand sanitizer and masks and gloves, all that good stuff. This is my favorite 1920s lamp, very pretty. Um, this is one of the sections of jewelry. So when you first walk in the door, this is what it looks like. And I switch out the inventory that's in here almost weekly. Um, some of it, some of it uh, stays a little bit longer than that, but I always add new stuff um, every day that I'm open. So there's that. And then I've got vintage purses, vintage hats, which are really fun. If anyone watches Marvelous Miss Maisel, um, these always remind me of her. I get a lot of fun 50s and 60s hats. Scarves. And then candy, because who doesn't want candy? Um, <laughs> and I always buy fun candy. Actually, Abigail had commented she loved. I got all these fun Wally Pops. Um, actually, it's really funny. This Wally Pop company does stuff for like Dior and Chanel, and, like all these big, uh, big brands will do custom Wally Pops. Um, but I got like all the vintage ones. So they have like old school Barbie, <laughs> pressed flowers and stuff. Um, so that's kind of fun. This cabinet here is what I'm working on doing restoration on. So I always have this right near the counter um, because then it's easy for me to pull them out in between people. So these are things I'm cleaning and mending currently. And then, turn around, I hope I'm not making anyone dizzy. <laughs> um, this is some soaps. We carry Finchberry soaps, uh, which are vegan, cruelty-free, but they look like cake, which is also why I bought them, because I just thought they were fabulous. And some linens, t-shirts, and then this is my counter. Um, so my boyfriend actually painted my logo up there, and he has a shop right next door to mine. He's got a tattoo studio, and he's also a SUNY Oneonta alumni. Um, but he uh, painted that and he also painted, there's a thank you sign at the front of the store. He painted as well. So this is kind of what I'll call my special collections area. So this is designer or extremely old pieces of clothing. So things that go back all the way to the 1840s and then some designer pieces too. Um, so the reason they're back here is just so I can help people try them on. Um, just so they don't get damaged in the process. Those are the cases for that. These are some of the antique purses and gloves and all kind of beautiful. Um, most of this stuff is 1920s or before. There's a couple of 1930s pieces. This, uh, yes. Can you, when you um, get to a certain item, can you pause on it a little bit longer? Totally. Just because so you can see, because it, it just takes a little mi minute for your computer to kind of catch your the screen to kind of catch up a little bit. No problem. Thank cool. you Thank for you. that. Um, yeah, I can actually show you this purse. is one of the oldest things I have. That is from between 1830 to 1850. Um, there's actually one of these that's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, same colors, actually, red and green, and it is silk with steel cut beads. That one's really cool, super old example, but there's a lot of this kind of 1920s beadwork because I just think it's so beautiful. So that's that. My friend actually built me this case out of an old window and pieces of a dresser, which was clever. Um, when I opened up in here, it was kind of an opening present to me. Um, and then this is my jewelry cabinet. So a lot of this is, I'll say the more like a state jewelry or fine jewelry. Um, and again, older pieces. So there's things that go back to about the 1840s in here as well. Um, but then there's also things that go all the way up through the 1940s. Um, so there's kind of a wide range of that type of stuff. How are we doing? Is it looking good still? Looking great. Okay, good. <laughs> this is really fun. This is actually a 1960s showgirl headpiece. 
and there is a matching um, top and arm cuffs that go to it. A dancer is actually in the process of buying that, which is really cool, because um, I, I do layaway on some of the items. So she's been working on doing that and she's get, planning on wearing it for a performance. These are the mirrors. So you can look fabulous when you come out of the dressing room, of course. Um, and then I've got another fun case in here. This one I do more just by color. Um, but this is kind of cool. It's an old case that was produced near Syracuse, New York. But then we actually put some 1940s fabric on the back to kind of brighten it up a little bit. So there's that case. And then there's some dressing rooms and my very scary back room, which you are not allowed in. <laughs> Um, and then this is where a lot of the reproduction vintage goes. So these are things that are vintage inspired, but not actual vintage. Um, lots of kind of gifty items. I love the 1960s and 1970s. And so there's a lot of stuff inspired by that. Um, so some gift items. And then there's not a ton here right now. We're actually just getting ready to stock for fall but these are some vintage inspired clothing pieces we have. And then I take you to vintage clothing land. So these, oh yes, you have a question? Yes, um, where, are there any trade shows that focus on the vintage inspired? Or do you go you to know, like magic and just have Not to really, there, there's, um, there's magic and there's, uh, another one that I'm blanking on the name of right now. I'm sorry. I will find out what it is. Um, I actually haven't been to either of them. Um, one of my friends also has a vintage shop and she carries a lot of vintage inspired items and she does go to trade shows, but I've done almost everything online or through going. I love visiting small shops when I travel. So a lot of times, like actually some of the soaps and candies, I got because we went to Portugal last year and I went to this shop that blew my mind um, called uh, Vida Portuguesa. And it was all like beautiful old packaging, um, apothecary stuff and candy. And so I wrote down some of the names and I talked to the owner and then I ended up ordering a lot of that stuff for my store too. So I don't really do a lot of trade shows. I more go shopping for myself and then <laughs> see right. what else I like. Um, and then again, I use that search engine too. Um, and what it's was crazy. The name of the search engine again? Uh, the name of the search engine, did you say? It's FAIR. It's F A I R E. Okay. And it's, um, yeah, it's like a wholesale buying thing, but it's crazy because, I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of vendors on there. So even if two stores are both getting their inventory from fair, they're going to pick totally different stuff, just like at a trade show. Right. Um, and I also like it because I find I can take my time and really be thoughtful about what I select rather than just like impulse purchasing a bunch. Like I know my friend has had some issues at the trade shows where she's like, I'll take it all. Right. And it doesn't end up being like even stuff she really wants or fits in with her store. So I love like just making a cup of tea and like sitting there for hours scrolling through things. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Love yeah, and you have a comment in the chat here. Um, somebody bought a beautiful blue crystal necklace for uh, from you to wear her to her daughter's wedding, and also bought the dress that she'll eventually be wearing. So she wanted to say oh. thank you. That's amazing. Thank you. I think I actually know the very one you're talking about. <laughs> That's amazing. Yes, and I, I'm sure um, you're going to be extra looking forward to the wedding. That is going to be amazing. <laughs> Thank you for telling me that. <laughs> yeah, feel free in the comments if you guys have questions or anything. Feel free to ask. Happy to address. They yeah, are Jennifer Grace in. kimonos. I love Jennifer Grace. I also have... Um, Jennifer Grace, wait a second. Um, Jennifer Grace bell bottoms that are like this cool kind of poppy print. I had a bunch more of the kimonos, uh, but they were summer ones, so they sold. But I'm gonna get fall ones in. I love her stuff. Um, so over here, 
this is, I'll call the more formal wear of the vintage stuff. Um, oh wait, I see Neve. I do know Neve, and she would look amazing in them. <laughs> Neve did intern with me here, and she is fabulous. I love her so much. Um, okay. So this is all of the, I'll say like party dresses. Um, there are a lot of things that are definitely more for getting dressed up and going to an event or doing a photo shoot. Um, most of the stuff on this rack ranges from the 1920s up through like the 1960s. Um, but there are a couple of older and a couple of newer too. Um, so I always do things by color. But if you are curious about how sizing works in vintage, I convert everything to a modern size chart um, based on one of the vintage reproduction brands I carry. And so I compare it with the chart and then I, it's all modern sizing done on the tags. So for example, this one is like an extra small and I, it's based off the bust and the waist measurements. So those are all written on the tag, but they're organized by color. Um, which actually, can I interject with a little informational vintage thing too? Absolutely. Please. Okay. So a lot of people think that vintage stuff is really, really small, which some of it is very small, but not all of it is small. There's a size bias thing where a lot of clothing that was um, bigger ended up getting resized for people because people were reusing things. So a lot of times the stuff that survived that a lot of people find is really, really tiny because it's the stuff someone couldn't turn into something else. However, I, it is a huge myth that there is not vintage clothing in all sizes. Um, I ha last year sold something that was a modern size 24 and it was a 1930s dress. So I definitely think that vintage is something, it's one of my big goals that everyone can wear vintage. It's just a matter of whether you want to and finding your style within that. Um, but I get things that are all the way from a double zero all the way up to a 24 all the time. So, and if you ever have questions about like what the sizing is like with vintage stuff, you can always ask me too, because some of the stuff was custom made. So the measurements may not exactly match up with modern day measurements too. So that's kind of fun little, little tidbit. Um, okay, so this was all the party dress type of situation. And then over here is I would say a little bit more gifty stuff. These are pretty cool. These are cocktail cubes. And what they are is basically like a ice cube that you mix, you know, alcohol or whatever with. Um, but they are based off recipes from the 1910s to the 1930s. And it is actually the grandsons of the two friends who originally made these recipes who run the company, which is really cool. And they have all the history of that, which is neat. Um, and then this is my little fireplace. Uh, this is the best during Christmas, hanging out and having hot chocolate, chilling out in front of the fire. Um, it's just an electric fireplace, but it feels cozy. And there's my couch. And then we've got a little bit more jewelry in here. Some t-shirts. These are cool. Um, these are all folk art inspired t-shirts, uh, traditional designs that are done on modern t-shirts. And then we've got, oh, you were asking before about where I find inventory. So this is another example. These boxes are, uh, these are match boxes, but they are done in uh, actual vintage packaging. Um, but these I actually found when we went to Ireland, they are from the UK. Um, but when we were in Ireland, I was at a shop that sold these and I thought they were so cool. So I ended up ordering them in here too. That's kind of fun. And then this is all the casual stuff. So I would say for casual stuff, mostly 1930s through 1980s. Um, but I also have some designer stuff mixed into this rack. Uh, vintage swimsuits, which are fun. Um, and I love anything embroidered. So there's a lot of embroidered pieces in here too. And then finally, I've got another little section with some beauty products and um, all sustainable beauty products. And oh, thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> and then last but not least, 
this is our photo booth. So um, if you've seen old Hollywood movies where they would have the paper moon, um, I wanted, I had this dream to do a lady in the moon instead of a man in the moon. Um, so this is my lady with her little UA tattoo for the underground attic. And so people will come get dressed and then they will take their picture in the moon. And my uh, boyfriend, who's a tattoo artist, who did the signs also painted that. And my friend Joshua made it. Oh, thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> Oh wait, that was Abigail. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's pretty much the grand tour. Oh, I can show you my beautiful ceilings and my the chandelier. But these are the original ceilings in here, which is pretty cool. And then um, these windows, stained glass windows up there were put in the building when I moved in, but they are period appropriate for the building, which is pretty cool. So, there you have it. Is there anything else you guys want to see? Or do you feel like you got a good sense of the store? I can show you my cool old cash register. This is on semi-permanent loan to me. It is 250 pounds. And when I got it, it was so tarnished you couldn't even see the numbers. And my friend sat there with, oh, thank you, Alison. <laughs> um, there was somebody, one of my friends sat there with a toothbrush and baking soda and got it all cleaned up so we could see all the numbers. Um, but that's really beautiful. So there you have it. The Grand Tour. I see the, every item you have in my size 16. <laughs> you gotta come in. We, I do personal shopping for people too. So if I know your measurements and colors and decades you like, I also, um, a lot of times will send people pictures, which is fun love doing that. You're going back on the tripod. <laughs> back to the still world. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I hope I didn't make anyone dizzy. <laughs> no, I think you did great. <laughs> Thank you. It's hard to tell on the little screen. You're like, <laughs> Definitely. Is that a COVID mask behind you? Oh, yeah. It's a fabulous COVID mask, of course. Oh, thank you, Cheryl. Um, so this is screen printed. I've got a moon phase one, and then I've got one with a luna moth. And then for all you Egyptian revival people, I got a uh, scarab one, too. <laughs> yeah. I bought one of my masks, the one I wear every day from Elizabeth's oh, store, actually. <laughs> Which print did you get? Did you get one of the... The blue bandana one. Nice. Yeah. James was one of those two. I really like them. Mm -hmm. The necklace you bought is check glass. Yes. I think it is too. I love check glass. That's actually something that I collect for myself, um, amongst other things, because I love all of it. But uh, yeah, check glass is something that sometimes makes it into the store and sometimes makes it into my wardrobe. So. <laughs> the perks of being a small business owner, right? When exactly. you go shopping, you're totally allowed to shop for yourself. We have a question from Miss Erica Mizrahi. Uh, do you have any tips for entrepreneurs who are opening brick and mortars right now? That's a really interesting question because especially with the right now part of it. So uh, I would say like my ongoing lesson that keeps coming up for me is that basically as long as my, my mom puts it as looking for the long view where it's expensive to open a brick and mortar. I'm not going to lie. It's expensive to fill it um, because online you can just have a couple of items that people can choose from and you're not trying to fill an entire store. Um, so it's expensive in that way. The overhead's more expensive and even just manpower. I mean, either you have to be sitting there or you have to hire somebody to be in there. So it is definitely a big endeavor, but to me, it's always been something um, when I would have minor freakouts about just putting all the pieces together. My mom would just say, look for the long view. And that I think it's, it's good to be aware of the different ways your business is functioning and how much you're making and everything like that. It definitely is important. But it's also good to not get too stuck in the day-to-day -day and think more on yearly or multiple year levels because it's just a lot of work and time and money. Um, but to me, it's been like, there was no question of it. Like, I, from the beginning, knew I wanted to do a brick and mortar, and I think it's extremely rewarding. Um, I do think, though, that it is integral that you um, both have a brick and mortar and do something online, though, especially um, if you're in a less populated area, like being in Oneana, 
Um, I think that is the way I've been able to grow a following even just for my brick and mortar is by attracting people through social media and the website, and different items like that. So that was a long rambly answer, but big things are not, not getting too stuck in the day to days and then also utilizing all your platforms of having the physical store, but also an online presence. Oh, good. Yeah. Feel free to ask me more questions too. <laughs> So you did answer the question. <laughs> yeah. Yay! <laughs> and I think your social, as somebody who follows all your social media, I think your social media is on point. So I think you're right about that. Thank you. That has been like one of those things. It's definitely like a learning curve because for me, you know, I guess when you are a person behind a brand, it's a little weird to put yourself out there as a the face of something and you don't want to feel like conceited being on, you know, social media all the time and stuff. But honestly, I have to say, especially during COVID, people connecting to you is not only good for them, but it's good for you too. It's like, it's way more fun and fulfilling to get input back and forth. And I like meet people who I become friends with talking to them on Instagram or my website or something. So I think it's part of just allowing to show that you're a human is a big part of having a small business. Absolutely. Speaking of your small business, um, I have a question and hopefully this is something interesting for everybody. How did you come to realize that you wanted to start your own business and sort of what was that journey like? Because I know you started as a student, so even younger, yeah. that must have been really interesting. Yeah, so um, it's funny. When I was in high school, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I tell this to people all the time, especially my interns who are in here were like, I don't know like, if I want to stay in this major. and. I will tell you right off the bat, I had no idea what I wanted to do in high school and I changed my major three times. So there's, you're allowed to be figuring things out. Um, so when I was in high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I have always loved vintage clothing and I always loved music. So originally when I went to school, I actually went as a music major and I didn't go to SUNY Oneana at first, I'm sorry, but I ended up there. Um, so I went to school in Potsdam for music for a couple of years. And when I was up there, I actually um, had also been working at the student newspaper and I had found myself, I was writing this fashion column and I wore vintage every day and I would go around campus and take pictures of people wearing their vintage stuff. So I was doing that and I was like, you know, I love playing music, but I don't think I want to be a music teacher. Like I just feel like my that's best as a hobby and I have a lot of creative energy where I might want to turn this into something else. So I am from the Oneana area. So I actually decided to transfer come to SUNY Oneana and um, so glad I did. I uh, became a fashion and textiles major and I um, kind of did the design concentration. I don't know if it's done the same way now, but I did the design concentration. Um, but when I moved, I needed to get a job and I was working part-time at Green Earth uh, to start, but I was like, there is, I had all this vintage clothing and Etsy was just starting to become a popular thing. So I started this blog where I would blog about vintage fashion and then I started selling on Etsy. And it started out kind of slow, it was a piece here, a piece there. But from the beginning, I was kind of like, I think this might be what I want to do. So I kind of geared my time at SUNY Oneana doing things that involved vintage fashion. So I took the costume history classes. I did some independent studies that were all for costume history and for entrepreneurship. And it culminated throughout that time in a project that I got to do that was a hundred years of fashion project. So I curated a collection, got to restore the pieces and then set them up in a, a gallery that, where the mannequins were around the room and people could see the differences between the decades. So that was really cool and I'd still been selling on Etsy. And around that same time, um, my boyfriend, uh, same current boyfriend, um, had a photography studio and the lease was just about to go up and I was broke, graduating college student. And this was one of those leap of faith moments where I was like, don't get rid of lease, I'm gonna sign the lease and I will make it work somehow. So I, before I even got my apartment, got a shop <laughs> and <laughs> was like, I'll just figure it out. So I uh, got this space and I was still working two other part-time jobs and selling on Etsy. 
so I was taking all the money I made at those jobs to buy inventory for this shop, which was basically an empty room upstairs on Main Street. <laughs> and um, I was selling online for a few months. And then that holiday season was the first time I opened. And that was in the winter of 2014. Because I graduated that May and I opened that December. Um, and then it was just such an awesome reception and I had so much fun that I was like, I think, I think I'm doing it. So I was in that location for about a year and a half. And then I ended up moving down to my, oh, you remember the upstairs shop? That's awesome. It was so pretty once you got up there, but there was a really sketchy staircase you had to go up. So I just wasn't getting like a ton of foot traffic, but it was really, it was a perfect little petri dish to try things in. Um, but now uh, I, I knew I wanted to expand my footprint. So I ended up doing a GoFundMe and uh, was able to, the stars just kind of aligned and I ended up, this space ended up opening and they were going to have to do renovations in the space anyway. So they said, if you have ideas on how you want to do it, we can help you do that. So I got to be from the very beginning having input on keeping the ceilings and putting in the stained glass and doing all of those things. So it really was this amazing kismet situation of that all falling together. Um, and yeah, so that's been amazing. I've been in this spot for three and a half years and it'll be four this October. So that's the grand evolution. I think that's really cool. <laughs> Thank you. As somebody who fun. is a, yeah, as somebody who is a similar age to you, I'm only a few years younger than you, I cannot imagine figuring out all of that. <laughs> but, it's, but clearly you've got it down. So you're very successful. <laughs> you. You're doing great. And even though I'm leaving, I will probably still continue to be a dedicated online shopper. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely like, I will not say that it has been a walk in the park the whole time. Like there have definitely been some really hard situations to navigate, COVID being one of them. I mean, it's, you just have to be fluid and adapt to so many different situations, but that's also why I like it. Like to me, I knew I wanted to do my own thing because I love this feeling of like, I'm the master of my destiny. Like I can kind of like come up, I like being a problem solver. Something pops up and then I can have different ways to approach it. Um, and that feels like a good mental exercise too, so. Oh, thank you. I love doing the mystery boxes. That has been kind of the next frontier. I started doing, um, I have one-time mystery boxes, but then I also have subscription-based ones. And that has been so much fun. I've always wanted to do a subscription service in here. And that was one of those things, a silver lining that came out of all of this is I had time to work on it and get the software put onto my website that can, you know, do the subscriptions. And um, so we ended up, we do a monthly vintage accessory box, a monthly self-care box, and then a monthly UA box, which is just all the different types of things I have in here. Oh, you got one for, uh, for your mother's day. Oh, that's really nice. Oh yeah, I remember the 30s necklace. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, they, Brooke is uh, one of my coworkers, actually. Brooke is also oh. somebody who works in the Division of College Advancement, so. Oh, cool. Several dedicated staff members. Yay. <laughs> yeah, they really, that has been like one of the most exciting things to me because I've never really had a product that I was able to market. Like vintage clothing is all one-offs, so you can't keep promoting the same thing because it's gone in a day. But it's been really fun with the subscription boxes because I've been able to reach out to way more people who then end up finding all the vintage clothing too. And that has definitely been one of those things that made me really excited about the future in here as just getting that whole program up and running. So it's been neat. <laughs> oh, um, sorry. Yeah, no, you're fine. Um, so can you tell us how your education at SUNY Oneonta and your experiences there have been helpful and have sort of prepared you to be a small business owner? Totally. Um, I think I particularly have two um, major things that I've gotten from it um, when I think about like what's instrumental in my everyday. So one is the fact that I was able to do so many independent studies. That was like 
I can't even tell you what an amazing time that was to kind of delve into what I was interested in, work closely with my uh, supervisors of those um, independent studies, and then come out the other end with something that was something I could show. Like I, I did the 100 Years of Fashion project. Um, when I did the um, entrepreneur one, I was really nice because I had kind of time to dig into really um, learning the back end of like Etsy. At that point, I was just doing Etsy. So learning the back end of that and uh, learning how to do you know analytics and how to market better and things like that. So having that time and guidance to focus on those things, I think was hugely instrumental in that time. And I still look back on that stuff all the time and use it all the time. So that was definitely one. And then the other thing was actually an extracurricular, but it, I was also on the newspaper at SUNY Uniana. And honestly, copy editing. It's like I use, not only was that like the most fun, I loved all my newspaper people, uh, but you do a lot of writing with a website and social media and all that stuff. Not to say I don't have typos. There are definitely some typos. Um, but uh, for the most part, just being able to uh, communicate effectively and having it look professional was one of those things that was time spent at the newspaper. Um, and that was, I, I still think is extremely instrumental in the way I do business. Thank you. Yeah. If anybody else has questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. So I will happily communicate those. Um, or if you wanna shout them out, by all means. <laughs> I like I like Zoom because it highlights your box, so it's not as difficult to like, you know, figure out if you're talking over people. Yes, absolutely. And I just got more comfortable with the whole chat function too. Not with Zoom, but I just did my first Instagram live sale on Sunday, and it was really fun. That's it, when I figured out this tripod. Um, but it was, <laughs> it's really fun to be able to uh, be able to see people's comments and then you know respond to them. Um, I love doing that with the live sale. I'm definitely going to keep doing them. Yeah, absolutely. I think Instagram has become like this really great tool for a lot of people to use. It doesn't seem to matter what industry you're in. It just has a lot of different options. We use it a lot. So yeah. Yep. I had done I one actually with the uh, fashion department. I had done an Instagram yep. live. That was really fun. Yeah. That was, that was one of the first things post COVID, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, we all have to get creative now, you know? Social media is the way to reach people. Yep, Can't reach absolutely. them in person, so. Oh, and I yeah. keep thinking that's why I um, have been trying to implement so many different things like the Instagram live sales, like the subscription boxes, all those different things, because honestly, we don't know what's gonna happen in the next year. And I know that for me, I, I was able to make the transition, um, you know, when we first had to shut down, but uh, part of, having your own business is being able to acclimate quickly. And so I wanted to have a lot of those things set up again in case we need to do that again. And if not, they're only gonna help me. So putting the infrastructure there to keep people um, engaged and keep your business going, I think is a really big part of weathering the storm. Mm -hmm. Whether it's COVID or something else, right? <laughs> exactly, yep. <laughs> I had you a flood never here a couple of years ago, and uh, so when I had Ooh. the flood, I had to do all online for a while, and uh, so that's, it was actually in some ways good because I was able to learn how to do a lot of that a couple of years ago. Um, it's again, I was saying before that necessity is the mother of invention thing, and <laughs> when you're kind of thrown into it, it's just, just gotta yeah. make it work. <laughs> yeah. Have I had any supplier issues due to COVID? That is a fabulous question. Um, Yes, in some ways, less so than other businesses. Um, I was lucky in that I was a shopaholic. No, I'm kidding. Um, but I have bought a lot of vintage stuff. And so I actually had enough stuff in my back stock that I was able to focus on doing restoration on during COVID that I was able to keep selling that. But I was a little bit concerned because I was like, if I burn through all of that, and I can't really meet people in person to buy stuff. I was concerned I wasn't going to have enough. Um, but actually right after things started opening up, I was lucky enough to have two separate vintage shops that ended up, um, either downsizing or closing contact me. And I was able to buy out, uh, most of their collection. 
So I have a lot of vintage stuff that um, I have in back stock now. So I should be set for a while with that. But on the flip side, all the modern stuff, um, some of the vintage inspired stuff I have that would normally come in two or three weeks to the shop was more like four months. So trying to reopen with some of those items, uh, just because some of them came from different places where they weren't allowed to ship or they couldn't get the one piece they needed in order to finish something, meant that uh, restocking to open was a little bit of a hot mess. Um, but it got there and actually everything ended up arriving on time. Um, I've also had some issues I ship all the time uh, from my website. And I've had a couple of issues with just uh, through COVID having issues with deliveries and like one package was going to uh, Belgium, I think. And it ended up sitting in Queens for like three months and then finally ended up with no tracking number showing up on the lady's doorstep. So there's been a lot of customer uh, engagement with that too, just trying to like track down the missing package and the things are just not running as smoothly as they once did. Well, hopefully people have been understanding that it's not, <laughs> it's not people your have fault. Been cool. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I have, um, I've been really lucky. I feel like there's people, especially with like small businesses right now, I think are understanding the struggle and just that you're wearing a lot of hats. Um, so people have been really, really awesome to work with, which is, I count myself lucky for that. Well, that's great. Does anybody else have any other questions before we let you all go about your day? Maybe grab a quick bite to eat if this was your lunch break. <laughs> and if not, I'm sure Elizabeth would be more than happy to connect with people. She's on social media as a follower. I highly recommend you go follow her social media. Um, she keeps a lot of updates there. So if you want to stay updated with her, that's a great way. And if you have any other questions for us or would like to join on other Red Dragon Lives, I know this is something we'd like to keep doing. So. Oh, thank you so much for these nice, uh, nice comments. That's awesome. Thank you guys for following and for tuning in and everything. Thank yeah, you so thank cool. you all. It was wonderful. Oh, yeah, thank you. it's great that we got faculty and alumni on this. That's always lovely to see, so. Yeah. So nice. All your comments were amazing. All right. Well, I think we will let everybody go then. Elizabeth, thank you so much for participating. Um, I'm glad this was my last thing. <laughs> uh, and thank you all for joining us today. I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you so thank much. You. Thanks for organizing this. Yeah, Bye, absolutely. Everybody. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Bye.